morning everybody um, and welcome to your English extended learning. So today I'm going to be introducing you to what we mean by Gothic literature. As a genre, it does go back hundreds and hundreds of years, so in 40 minutes, I have no time to do it justice. So instead, my aim is going to be to give you an overview, briefly, I hope, and then model how we can look at two texts through a Gothic lens. And by doing that, hopefully ignite your interest, whet your appetite, and leave you with some extracts for you to have a look at ahead of our seminar next week. I'd like you to begin by watching the Massillet video presented by Professor John McRae. Um, you can see that I've actually put a link here and I've also put the link in assignment for classroom. So it takes about 12 minutes. So if you can pause this video here, watch the Massillet video, and then come back to this presentation. So in the video you've just watched, McRae historicizes the Gothic. It was and has always been born out of its time and place. So as a movement, it both reacts to cultural and social anxiety, but it also shapes it. And as McRae pointed out, the Gothic necessitates a return to the past. As so often in times of progress, we look back, sometimes with regret and longing, sometimes with relief. And this conflict, that one between past and present that's found in Gothic literature, is just one conflict. Because Gothic literature thrives in liminal spaces, at times of tension, on the precipice of change, and also on the precipice of boundaries. Its literature interrogates that fine line between so many things, between beauty and terror, reason and imagination, good and evil. And if all this feels a little new and you're thinking you've never actually read any Gothic text, and I'd like you to think about texts that you've already read or even studied, such as Macbeth. So think about how the typically Gothic evil witches are contrasted with the hero Macbeth at the beginning of the play, but how these definitions of good and evil become increasingly troubling as the play progresses. And always with the Gothic, it asks its readers to imagine the blurred line or the tipping point when the status quo, everything we know or are familiar, even comfortable with, can suddenly crumble, tip into oblivion or be destroyed altogether. So these texts are both conservative and transgressive. They're cautious and they're bold. Some of you will have studied the Duchess of Malfi. Think about that play for a moment. Think about the staunch conservatism of the court, which is clinging to an old system of power but think also about how that's pitted against a changing world. That text is also rendered Gothic through its style. Think about the wax effigies, the dead man's hand, and the recurring preoccupation with blood and death. So with Malfi, with many Gothic texts as well, the audience and reader are invited to both revel in the spectacle, but also recoil from it. And it's this ambiguity that these texts explore and inspire in readers. And in my opinion, is what makes them so fascinating. So now I want to touch in on two texts in more detail, and I want to think about how we can look at them through that Gothic lens. One of them was written at the end of the 19th century and is set at that time. The other is written, was written, sorry, in 2011, but sets itself in 2000, sorry, written in 2011, but set in 1945. And what I want to argue connects them is their Gothicness. So I'm going to begin by just briefly talking about Dracula, which is probably the most recognisable title in the Gothic canon. So where did Stoker get his title from when he was writing this book at the end of the 19th century? Well, he drew upon the actual historical figure, Vlad Tepes, or Dracul, as he was known, who was Prince of Wallachia, which is now part of Romania. And he was a national hero, but he was also a bloodthirsty tyrant who ordered thousands of people to be impaled just for his pleasure. And these punishments were very much one of the things that inspired Stoker to write his book. And I think it's important to consider why he chose to take this particular historical figure and transpose him to the 19th century and to Britain. So he may have been inspired, I suppose, quite simply by the kind of gratuitous, gory nature of Vlad's story. Um, Vlad the Impaler was actually kind of forgotten around this time and Stoker resurrected him. But I think more significantly, I think that it allowed him to foreground one of the key Gothic concerns, really, which is that conflict between the past and the present. So in Dracula, the Count represents an aristocratic lineage, old blood, money and power. And in the novel, he lives in Eastern Europe and is in the process of buying a property in London. And a young lawyer, Jonathan Harker, journeys from London to help the Count draw up the legal documents. Where the Count is an aristocrat, 
Harker is part of a rising middle class as he's a lawyer. In other words, he's a man that's earning his status through education and work. So he, like the other men in the novel, embody Victorian modernity. So once again, Stoker presents us with a conflict between the past and the present. And this is very obvious in the opening pages of the novel. As Harker begins to journey into Transylvania, he notes that it's a country steeped in history. And he takes lots of notes about the castle, about the surroundings and about the folklore. And even the very first entry in his diary, which begins the novel, very much marks out Harker as a typical middle class Briton. Notice if, if you have a little look just at the first line, he says 3rd of May, Biritz left Munich at 8.35pm on the 1st of May, arriving at Vienna early next morning, should have arrived at 6.46, but train was an hour late. He is preoccupied with all things rational and exact. Um, he documents times and places throughout his journal, which makes up the first part of this book. And therefore, what we have is an exotic Gothic past focalised through the perspective of a Western modern bourgeois lawyer. And as the story progresses, Stoker asks what happens when this past clashes with this particular present, when they collide? Is modernity so at odds with the former life of a country and culture? Well, in the book, I would suggest that Stoker says that this is very much a problem, because by the end of the novel, the Count will have journeyed to England, having tortured Harker and will continue to wreak havoc on its contemporary citizens in England. It's only when he states at the very end of the book that the uncivilised past gives way to arguably what the Victorians saw as the enlightenment of modern times. Similarly, in The Little Stranger, so just a reminder that this was written in 2011, but is set just after the Second World War. And it's set in a grand country house in Warwickshire, and it traces the struggles of the aristocratic heirs family who were struggling to keep such a large house going. And the narrator, Dr Far Faraday, observes what it's like as an adult when he returns to it. He was used to it as a child because his mother was supposed to be a servant there. And he notes straight away that it's a place that is rife with decay. When I saw the house almost 30 years on from my first visit, the changes in it appalled me. The steps leading up to the front door were cracked with weeds growing lushly up through the seams. And the house itself really becomes symbolic of a past that is eroding. The magnificence and the enduring nature of wealthy families at the time themselves were very much under threat and weren't particularly relevant in a modern age. And the heir's family in this story embody that archetypal aristocratic English family that are in decline. And therefore, the novel documents the literal collapse of such a house, but also by extension, a particular social order. So the young son, Roderick, who essentially is the master of the house, is described as looking very much like the country squire. However, there are lots of references in the novel to the fact that he's really playing at this. It's not working. He's meant to have been shell-shocked in the war, his face has been terribly disfigured, and he struggles to keep on top of the running of the house. Instead, it's the narrator Faraday, the village doctor, who, like Harker in Dracula, and has achieved his position through education and work, they come to rely on him. He's the one that can solve things. So Waters, really, Sarah Waters, the author, gives us a reversal of tradition whereby the landed gentry, once responsible for employing workers, are now reliant on the lower classes around them. The point's made even clearer when we learn that Faraday's mother was actually one of the heirs' servants. So Waters suggests that the past is in a steady decline and making way for a new world. And when a new family called the Baker Hides, who are meant to very much represent new money, move into the area, they have basically they invite the Baker Hides round for a kind of dinner party. Um, and it was meant to, I suppose, be a kind of moment where the heirs feel very much in power again, enjoying their sense of the kind of family of the neighbourhood. However, unfortunately, the young Baker Hyde girl is bitten by the dog Jip because something seems to whisper in its ear. And so begins one of the many unnerving events that threaten to deceit the family from their previous throne. So when the dog bites the girl, I think Waters is implying that this feudal past and this new brash modernity are incompatible. The old in this book, just like in Dracula, has to be defeated for new modernity to flourish. And this very much brings us on to another conflict, which is this idea of superstition versus rationality, or the supernatural versus the logical 
because the hauntings at Hundreds Hall become more frequent and disturbing. And it's their friend and neighbour, Dr Faraday, Faraday, who tries to make sense of things. And in the same way in Dracula, Jonathan Harker tries to confront vampirism with logic. So just like Faraday, um, Dracula's bourgeois narrator Harker acknowledges the divide between himself and the aristocratic Dracula. He is like a Victorian tourist, sort of taking in the ancient superstitious sites, and he's actually incredibly dismissive of, I suppose, really the um, the local natives and the superstition that they, that he feels they impose on him. He describes Transylvania as an imaginative whirlpool of historical superstition. And by framing the country in such historical, even mythological terms, he notes, if you like, an explicit distinction between Transylvania's superstitious past and his own modern rational attitude. Similarly, in The Little Stranger, the rational doctor, Faraday, refuses to accept any kind of supernatural explanations for the hauntings. Instead, he cried, I'm a doctor. This is all superstitious nonsense. In Harker's case, the more his experiences in Transylvania, in Transylvania unsettled him, the more he resolves to write down all his experience, experiences in his diary. He tries to make sense of them. So he holds on to language, which for him symbolises rationality. Similarly, Faraday spends much of the novel trying to convince the heirs that there must be a scientific or rational explanation. So modernity is not simply drawn in contrast to the past here, but also used to challenge old orders. It's not unusual for Gothic literature to take ref refuge from the illogical and the frightening in reason. Many of you will have read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you may have even studied it. Um, and um, Utterson claims quite early on in the novel, when he wants to find out exactly what's going on with Mr. Hyde, he says, if he be Mr. Hyde, I shall be Mr. Seek. And it's a phrase which resonates explicitly with detective stories, another popular genre in Victorian England. And it's one that very much is concerned with the idea of dispelling and punishing malevolent acts through the methodical processes of science and investigation. Um, but predictably, Gothic texts challenge the idea that reason can answer all. Reason is actually shown to be relatively weak and ineffectual in these novels. So where Faraday clings to the idea of a rational explanation, despite all evidence to the contrary, it kind of encourages the reader to doubt his own perception and therefore see his narrative perspective as skewed and unreliable. So too, Harker attempts to sort of assert himself as a rational and logical man in contrast to the Count. However, the more he tries to do this, ironically, the more Stoker reveals parallels between the two. So Dracula is aristocratic and foreign, but he also is shown to be a Western scholar who is capable of modernising and anglicising himself. So Dracula exerts power over his victims, not simply by drinking their blood, but also immersing himself in British culture. So we can see here that Harker notes that the Count keeps a vast number of English books of the most varied kind, all relating to England and English life and customs and manners. And this is one of the most com uncomfortable things about the Gothic, when those fixed definitions that we're all comfortable with are somehow subverted or challenged. So in other words, it's the Count's methods to achieve this resemblance, which actually mirror the practices of reading and research, those very modern human Victorian practices that Harker clings to. So the boundary between reason and chaos, supernatural and logic collapse, but even that of human and vampire. In the novel, the Count is able to pass as an ordinary British citizen, and in fact, Harker is actually mistaken for the Count in Transylvania. And the ultimate affinity between Dracula and Harker is suggested when Harker looks in the mirror, expecting to see the Count, but sees only his reflection reflected back at him. So we even have the idea of human and vampire, a boundary supposedly very, very clear. It's actually shown to be an illusion. Likewise, in The Little Stranger, Faraday's attempts to promote rational thought are not only shown to be futile, but even ironic. At the end of the novel, he actually, having spent the entire time trying to uncover the source of the hauntings, describes how he frequently visits hundred halls, hundreds halls still, even though it's now deserted. And this is what he says. These are the closing lines of the novel. If hundreds hall is haunted, however, its ghost doesn't show itself to me. For I'll turn and I'm disappointed, realising that what I'm looking at is only a cracked window pane, and that the face gazing distorted from it, baffled and longing, is my own.
Waters finishes by implying that actually the narrator himself, the real source of logic, has been responsible for this terror. So we have a form of doppelganger, a double, another gothic trope. Just as Harker literally mirrors Dracula, so too Faraday mirrors the very supernatural phenomenon he spends much of the novel trying to disprove and dispel. Because in Gothic texts, the supernatural is not so easily separated from the rational. Which moves us on to the idea of setting and place. So the fact that Stoker chose to set Dracula mainly in Victorian England is something that I've already touched on, can't be ignored. Not only may this be unsettling for the reader that the English hero is undeniably similar to the vampire, but the fact that the vampire steps onto English soil with such ease would have been very uncomfortable for a society that was kind of coming to the end, really, of what had been an incredible time for empire and power. Because it surely it suggests that the backbone of British society is not as airtight or as stable as one might think. At this time, during the fantasy Eccle, there was much to celebrate about Victorian Britain. Um, however, beneath the surface, at the end of the century, this progress paradoxically led to anxiety over the loss of empire, the loss of a once green and pleasant land, and all sorts of consequences for the individual because of the Industrial Revolution. The fact that Dracula is able to westernise himself and move freely around London reveals the kind of insecure and fragile nature of Britain's cultural identity at the time. You could even argue it offers as a kind of reverse colonisation. Stephen Durata here argues that what Britain sees is their culture's imperial ideology mirrored back as a kind of monstrosity. In other words, instead of the British claiming power abroad, the foreigner in this novel stakes a claim on British native land. Similarly, it's British identity that is spotlighted in The Little Stranger. However, rather than the foreigner being the subject of interest here, the outsider, the other, is very much the lower class. There are lots of references to the grandeur of the house um, and the fact that the workers still very much kind of in some way subscribe to a certain hierarchy. So when Mrs. Ayres dies, there's a description of the workers donning their caps and we get this sense that, well, it all speaks really of the kind of quintessential English country model. And traditionally, the decline of those houses was associated with elegance and nostalgia, particularly after two world wars, which very quickly saw um, a closing of these great estates and often given over to charities such as the National Trust. However, Waters cleverly subverts this. So just as Stoker responds to the cultural anxieties that were permeating um, the end of the 19th century, um, Waters suggests that actually it's social mobility that is something, she dramatises, I should say, the anxiety of social mobility and what this means for those families like the heirs that once held power. So Roderick, who's the master of the house, complains that the servants now get a better deal. The, the house almost becomes a microcosm for the British class movement. We see the rise of the working and the middle classes and the decline of the upper classes. So you get the sense of the haunting, if you like, enacts the displacement of the old order with the new. Crucially, however, Waters doesn't glamorise the house or frame it in nostalgic terms. The decline of such a wealthy legacy is not sentimentalised. Rather, the past is actually shown to have quite a sort of troubling legacy. There's references to, for instance, the little Indian monkey, the, um, the slave bracelet, what we have is a suggestion that these houses' prosperity was due to slavery and imperialism. And therefore, Waters suggests that by exploiting those below them, families like the heirs have survived for a long time at the expense of others. So unlike Stoker, who suggests that Britain is under threat from the other, they literally chase the count out of England. Waters suggests that it might be time for the English house to make way for the other, the lower class. In this case, rather than Faraday, it could even be argued that the spectre, the haunting that sort of infects the house, isn't even Far Faraday, but someone even more closely linked with the family's model of hierarchy, the servant Betty. She isn't given a choice about exactly what she does. She complains about the awful dress that they've given her. She has to stick to the back passages and she's terribly miserable and homesick. Her hands are described as thick and stained, marked by excess of labour and poverty. And by the end, however, she's moved rooms. She's actually moved up to be next to the lady of the house on that floor. And Mrs. Ayres actually leaves her her clothes and her jewellery, symbolically suggesting that the upper class tradition must die in order to make way for a new emerging underclass. If we now look briefly 
because I say briefly, this is a big topic, it's sexuality and gender. Um, it's another one that cuts straight to the heart of Gothic anxiety here. Um, in Victorian times, there's so much to say, but if I give you a very quick overview to consider Dracula, um, anxiety went very much hand in hand with this idea of gender role shifting. Again, in short, the new woman emerged, a kind of new, bolder, more independent model of womanhood, which threatened what was termed the angel in the house, the more domestic, typical feminine idea of femininity, really. And this was seen as a threat to the family. And another threat to the family emerged in the guise of homosexuality. There was great concern of, over this at the moment. Consider Oscar Wilde, for instance. And it has been argued that much of Dracula's popularity at the end of the century resulted from its hostility towards female sexuality. So that's what I'll consider first. So when Lucy, one of the men's fiancés, is turned vampire, the men set out on killing her. And she is described in a way that is monstrous and explicitly sexual. Um, she is described, for instance, as her hair, like coils of Medusa's snake. And she's described as clutching a child strenuously to her breast. And Stoker gives us a kind of transgressive image here, a mocking picture of Lucy feeding off a child, which shows her kind of gender transgression rather than nurturing a child. She is feeding off it. So Lucy, you could argue, almost becomes a parody of a new woman, a monstrous version of an independent woman, supposedly more masculine or even monstrous than woman or female at all. Um, and how do the patriarchs in this novel deal with this? Well, you can probably guess. They kill her violently. They use their own phallic symbol, the stake, to return Lucy back to her state of purity. And just a couple of um, quotes there that you can see. Um, the description itself is very interesting. She's described as squirming and the blood squirting and very much Stoker kind of suggests the act is akin to rape because the stake reinserts or reasserts, sorry, male dominance over a woman to the point of death. Waters presents her female character, Caroline, in a sort of more, I suppose, in some ways, quite a similar way. Um, but from the very outset, unlike Lucy, who changes from being this supposedly perfect Victorian angel to a monster, Caroline very much from the outset does not conform to what we might expect from a kind of traditional patriarchal model of femininity. She is described as eccentric, shabby and even masculine. And this frustrates Faraday, who takes an interest in her. It's clear that he wants her to embody an archetypal woman and even admits to feeling a sting of anger when she accompanies him to a dance in a shabby dress. His desire to remodel her gender makeup is made clear when he says that he plans to take her to buy her some decent dresses. However, throughout the novel, Caroline resists this. She refuses to play the country lady and breaks off her engagement to Faraday. In fact, unlike Dracula, who arguably offers its readers a more conservative model of gender by returning the othered woman to her state of conformity, Waters seems to challenge this. Caroline's sexuality remains ambiguous throughout the novel, as does her gender. She admits it's exhausting to be a woman, and Faraday admits that there was something false about her performance. And Waters, from her 21st century perspective, suggests that gender is fluid and not fixed, and she uses the Gothic novel perfect with its claim to fluidity and liminality to show this. So in both novels, although before I move on, I should say very quickly that actually Caroline is killed at the end of this. And it's you could argue that it is her resistance, if you like, to the model that Faraday tries to fix her with that means she actually ends up meeting her fate. So there is perhaps, Waters does still question whether, particularly from a patriarchal perspective, there is room for this new fluid female identity. But in both novels, you can also say that gender inversion or ambiguity is punished by those who would seek to uphold more fixed and traditional models of men and women. Um, and the last point I wanted just to say is that significantly, it isn't just women in this novel that require some attention. Gender transgression is not just the reverse of the female in Dracula. Where women become sexually ferocious, men come to occupy a more traditional female place of passivity. In fact, the various displays of male emotion imply that stalwart manhood, the steward, one of the male characters coins, is nothing more than a veneer. So you can see that weighted with anticipation, 
Holmwood is described as waiting spellbound. Another of the male characters is described sobbing. We have lots of moments where the men display more traditionally female behaviour, perhaps. Um, likewise, in The Little Stranger, the master of the house, Roderick, is committed to the loony bin in a near hysterical state. Similarly, the sexual interactions are by no means clear cut. So the gender boundaries are blurred by Caroline's masculinity, but still further, um, when Waters, Waters almost describes a moment of homoeroticism between Roderick and Faraday when he's helping to try and heal Roderick's leg with a particular machine. Faraday notes that he was good looking and charming. And in the bedroom, when he performs this experiment on the leg with this machine, he describes later to a colleague that the electric current was almost like a sexual charge. It's certainly the most sexual, sexually charged moment in the novel. Again, the Gothic shrouds its very content in secrecy, but as in Jekyll and Hyde, for instance, when we are led to question the kind of relationship between the men in that novella, so too we question Roderick and Faraday's attraction to each other, or the bind of the little band of men in Dracula that seems, if anything, at times more secure and tight than the male-female relationships. So, as with other comparisons I've drawn, all of these have in common is the fact that in a typically gothic way, they're responding to the anxieties of their age, but they're also symptoms of their age. And at both times, sexuality um, prompted by changing gender roles was a source of increasing anxiety. And that's something the novel continues to explore now. So, I hope I haven't rushed through that too quickly, but what I wanted to do was just show you how we can connect texts via their gothic tropes and their gothic concerns. So what I've done now is I have on your classroom assignment, I have given you an extract from Dracula and an extract from The Little Stranger, neither of which I've talked about in this presentation. And I would like you to read them and annotate them and make some notes ready for a discussion for our seminar next week. I've, so that's for Little Stranger and Dracula. In a third document, I've given you five other extracts as well. I've given you two poems and three extracts from prose pieces, all 20th century, the prose pieces. Um, they're not too long. I would ask you to definitely read and annotate the extracts from Dracula and Little Stranger, but maybe a minimum of two from the other extracts as well, just so that we have enough between us to explore. In this last slide, you can see I've just said, well, how do I read the text through Gothic lens? I haven't given you questions, but just a reminder of some of those things that you would expect to find in Gothic literature and that you can very much try and look out for and allows you really a way into the text. So these are terror and threat, beauty, death, blood, rationality, logic, the supernatural, superstition, gender, subversion, transgression, the past, boundaries, decadence, excess, anxiety, power. The list is by no means exhaustive, but just a few things you could explore. I hope that has been of some interest and I hope that you can really, I hope get stuck into these extracts. I'll be really fascinated to see what you make of them. So I look forward to seeing you next week on Tuesday and it'll be absolutely lovely to hear everything you have to say. Thank you very much.